All right, well, good morning. You all can be seated. Uh, welcome to The Well. My name is um, Alex. I'm one of the pastors here, and today I have the honor and the privilege to preach God's Word. Uh, if you don't know, our lead pastor, Pastor Al, he's out, out on vacation uh, for a few weeks, and so pray for him, pray him and his family get some rest um, and that they come back prepared and ready to continue to, to serve God and His people. But they'll be out for the next two weeks. Uh, I'll be preaching. Then Pastor Jonathan Ellis will then take the following two weeks after that as we continue our series in Ancient Paths. And so if you're new with us, that's where we've been the past couple weeks. We just started a new summer series called Ancient Paths. Um, and we have talked about this the past couple weeks now. Uh, the first week in particular being that we see in uh, Jeremiah 6.16, this is the way that the Lord encourage us, encourages us to walk, and we'll look at that more in a minute. But he says in Jeremiah 6.16 that this is the good way. That's the, that's the language that's, that's used, that this is the good way to walk in it, to find rest for our souls. And so that path this week that we're going to be looking at is God's word, that di- the, the spiritual discipline of reading loving, delighting in God's word. And so it's our aim during this series, I just want to be clear, to cultivate faith-driven obedience. And so that's going to be what this series is going to continue to be about. This week, God's word. Next week, we're going to be looking at prayer. And so be sure to join us these next following few weeks. But today, God's word. And so if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 1. Uh, if you need a Bible, though, go ahead and raise your hand. One of our ushers will, will give you one. And then if you don't own a Bible, if you don't have a physical copy of the Bible, we want this, you guys to keep this. It might arguably be, as we'll see today, one of the most important gifts you could receive. And so keep it. It's for you and read it, all right? So we'll be, I, I lied a little bit. We'll be in Psalm 1, but before we get there, I want to look at Jeremiah 6.16. And so if you want to turn there, Jeremiah 6.16, if not, it's on the screen, and we'll come back to Psalm 1 in a moment, all right? So Jeremiah 6.16 says, Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look, and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And so what we see is that there's a path that the Lord instructs us to walk in for our good. The path we're looking at today, as I said, is the law of the Lord. It's God's word. And then we'll see in Psalm 1 today, the encouragement, the exhortation is for us to delight in the law of the Lord. We're to meditate on the law of the Lord. And in so doing these things, we, as Jeremiah says, find rest for our souls. We find rest for our souls. Additionally, and we'll talk at length about the discipline and the, and the practicality of this today, uh, of reading God's word, I want to remind us that we have a Father in heaven who desires to meet with us. And so Pastor Al talked a bit about this, the why last week. If you missed that, I encourage you to, to go back and listen to it. I won't talk at, at length about it, but I want to hit on it briefly, that your Father in heaven desires to meet with you. He wants a relationship with you. And so last week we talked about silence and solitude with our Father in heaven. And so much of that time in silence and solitude uh, involves the next two weeks of spiritual disciplines and things that we're going to be talking about, Bible reading and prayer. It's part of what we do, if not almost all that we do in silence and solitude. And so I want us to remember that God the Father sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die in your place for your sins so that he might know you, so he might get to have a relationship with you. He might get to spend time with you and have that silence and solitude, that reading of God's word, him forming you, maturing you through that time. He wants to teach you, mature you, sanctify you. Your father in heaven wants you in his presence. And so he urges us in Jeremiah 6, 16, to walk the righteous path from the Lord. And so Today, you will either leave, either leave here and declare either to walk the path of the righteous, given from the Lord, or like the fools in Jeremiah 6.16, you'll say, we're not going to walk in it. I will not walk in it. But ultimately, you have to decide. And so that's kind of where we're at. Um, that's just a little, little bit of a back to back up a bit, but let's go ahead and get into Psalm 1. So it's Psalm chapter 1, and we're going to look at 1 through 6, okay? 
I'm going to read it all and then we'll go from there. And so verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will will perish. And so as I said, the path we're discussing today, it's God's word. And what it looks like to walk according to God's word. And so what the psalmist describes, we see here in Psalm 1, is as verse 1 says, right? The blessing to be had as we walk according to the law of the Lord. Additionally, that the blessed man does what? He delights in it. He delights in God's word and he meditates, which simply means to to think about thinking on the scriptures, on God's word. But the reality is that these things, these disciplines, the reading of God's word has to be cultivated in our day-to-day lives every single day. And so that's where we're at. Psalm 1 begins, he says, blessed is the man. This word blessed, it, it simply means happy, or, or for us, it'd be more helpful to say like true, true, genuine happiness. The blessed man does these things that we see, or the things, he doesn't, he doesn't do certain things, and as a result, is truly happy. And so the psalmist, essentially, we see he's declaring where true happiness is, and then he's declaring where true happiness is not, where it's not found. And so it is to say that this is the truly happy life, the blessed man. This is the way, this is the path for which for us and for most Americans, this should resonate with us. It should pique our interest a bit because in today's culture, in, as we live day to day, who does not want to be truly happy? Everybody is pursuing happiness. Because it's not an absurd thing to say that our world, our culture, and everyone in America desires and is regularly pursuing happiness. That everyone in our culture is doing this. And so people desire to have a happy life. Every single day there's actions, steps taken to get that happiness. And so the psalmist is saying here that the blessed or the truly happy man does not do a few things at minimum, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the way of sinners, does not sit in the seat of scoffers. I hope we hear this. He's he's saying you will not find true happiness in blessing, rebelling against God's word, his ways, his wills. You won't find true happiness in blessing and submitting to the counsel of the wicked and the evil men, and their foolish opinions. You will not find true happiness in standing and acting in the way of sinners. He says you will not find true happiness in in doubling down on sin and mocking and scoffing and testing the Lord with your actions. True happiness, the blessed man, the truly blessed man will not do such things, period. Period. Furthermore, the psalmist says, right, we should not walk in step. So we shouldn't be mimicking. We shouldn't be copying the wicked. There should be a a difference. We should not continue to rebel. So if we know we're in rebellion, we we should cease. We should repent and not further emulate sinners. And as verse 1 says, we should not sit, which if if it's not clear when we look at these postures, the sitting, the standing, the walking, of the three postures we see, this one, sitting, is, is, it's the worst posture to be in. And so right now, I just, I just want to ask us, is, I want you to think about, and I want you to think about and consider who would people say that you mimic most? Who would people say that you mimic most? Who do those that love you, that you spend time with regularly, that know you, who do they say that you look like? And then I want you to think about why you may look that way. What's the cause? 
What are you, the reality is, is we're being formed day to day by, th- by everything. And so what are you regularly being formed by? Are you being more formed by the media subtly that you're watching and enjoying? I know a lot of us have, I have Instagram, I'm not against Instagram, I'm just saying when you look at your feed, when you look, what does the algorithm say that you follow, that you like, that you're enjoying, that you're watching and subscribe to? Are you being formed by those things? Ultimately, there's just two groups of people, according to Psalm 1. There is the non-happy, wicked, and they are content. They're content with being formed by these ways, the ways of the world. And then they're formed by other wicked individuals. Day to day, they're being formed by these people. The non-happy, the wicked person's life is formed by scoffers, people who, who are content with testing the Lord. And you see it in the way they act. You see it in the way they walk, stand, and sit, as the psalm says. And then there's the blessed individual, the truly happy and righteous man. It's real simple. They're formed by God's word. They're formed by God's word, and they pursue God in his word. And so if someone wants to look at your life, is that evident? That's the question. Is that evident? What would someone say that you're formed most by what would someone say you look and act like the most? And so my, my encouragement today would be that regardless of, of the answer to some of these questions is that we would say, today I'm going to take up God's word. Today I'm going to pursue the righteous path laid before me. And I'm going pers- to seek to be formed by God's word. I'm going to seek to obey God in his will. I'm going to seek to submit myself to his word, will, and ways. That's what I would encourage us to resolve to you today. But because the blessed man does not do what we, because the blessed man does not do what we see in verse 1, but rather, as verse 2 says, what does he do? He says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his, on his law, he meditates day and night. And so he doesn't do the things we just laid out and described. But what? He delights in the law of the Lord. We're talking about God's word today. This is it. We're talking about regular, daily reading of the Bible, of God's word, of his law. And the reality is, is some of us already right now, as I'm saying these things, are beginning to respond in a way, uh, standing, walking, sitting, however, like the wicked. What I mean is some of us are tired of hearing that we should read the Bible, that we should read God's word. Some of us are frustrating with hearing our other brothers and sisters, other Christians going, hey, you should be reading God's word. Some of us are scoffing at the simplicity of what we see here in Psalm 1 and its implications. And if you're frustrated or any of that in any way, shape, or form resonates with you, I just want to remind you again of something. You can't expect to be spiritually well if you live apart from the word of the Lord. You can't. You can't expect to be spiritually healthy if you divorce yourself from God and his word. It doesn't work that way. The Father and His law, His word, is the very thing in actuality that will sustain you, Christian. That's it. And so if you're a Christian, you need, to, you need the Lord God and you need His word every single day. Lest you, be, lest you live and be spiritually malnourished, ineffective and good for nothing, as we see in the scriptures, but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Additionally, what we're setting out to do, I want to encourage us, because I, I know I, many of us have made efforts, regular efforts, and practical ways to do this. That what we're setting out to do is, in, in agreeing with God's word, and delighting in God's word, meditating on it day and night, Jesus has done this perfectly. Jesus has done this perfectly. Furthermore, Jesus has not walked in the way of sinners, but he delighted and delights in the law of the Lord perfectly. Jesus understood and experienced the goodness of his Father's law, meaning he understood it wasn't just, here's all these rules I got to follow. They're meant to restrict me from being truly happy. Rather, as Psalm 1 describes, 
the blessed man is the one who finds the light in his father's law. That was the posture. That was the reality. That was the way in which Jesus saw and lived his life in light of God and his word. And so I want us to see it's not just about, all right, I got to leave. I got to read. That's it. I, I want us to see it's not just about reading and obeying God's law, but also realizing, realizing his law is good. His law is good. It's for our good and leads to life and flourishing. And so Jesus was a blessed and truly happy man in the presence of sinners like you and I, yet did not walk, did not stand, or sit like them. He was sinless. And it was because he was submitted to, he trusted in, and he delighted in his Father and his Word. That's the result. And so ultimately, the point is, is that I want us to leave and go, all right, I got to know my, I got to know my God. I want to know, I want to be formed by his word, but our hope is not in, in our own righteousness. Our hope is not in our own perfected plans. It's in Jesus and Jesus' righteousness, period. And so Jesus did what you and I, I know, struggle and perhaps fail often to do, but we are still called to do it. We're still called to delight in and meditate on God's word. And so that's my questions for us are, do you see the scriptures as a delight right now? Like, where are you at? And is that the posture and response that you have when you sit down and you open God's word? Do you love the scriptures? Get joy in the scriptures. Perhaps sometimes, maybe it's like half the time, maybe. Maybe you do it more out of duty. You know you got to do it. You know you need to obey, right, as we've talked about, and you're like, I'm just going to do it which I wouldn't encourage you to stop, stop doing that. I would say keep obeying, that's good. Maybe you find yourself reading and 100%, there's no delight. There's no, it's burdened. I feel burdened. Maybe you're prone and quick to wander from the law of the Lord except when tensions and trials are high. And only then, only when life is incredibly difficult do you go, God, I need you. Regardless of the reason, or where you find yourself, for the, for the waning of delighting and meditating on God's word, our response, no matter where you're at, hear this, our response must not be to walk away altogether from God's word, but to run to it, to cling to it, to God and his word, and then ask and pray, Lord, increase my delight. I'm here. God, help me. Increase my delight as I read. And then as we feel an absence of delight and recognize a lack of of thinking on and meditating on God's word, the response must be a posture of running to the Lord and his word, not away. And when we pray, we ask God, help us to see the scriptures, Lord, Holy Spirit, help us to delight in them the way that you see them, the the ways in which your word declares. And we keep reading, we keep enjoying and submitting every day. Because the reality is, is the, the one way we end up delighting on the law of the Lord more is, in fact, by reading and meditating on it, right? Like, not, not the inverse of that. Meaning when you, right, you find yourself reading, you're like, man, it's, I'm not delighting. I'm just here. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm not delighting. I'm not awake. And your response becomes, I'm just, gonna, I'm just not going to do this right now. I'm going to close God's word. And you put down the scriptures you're not going to, I'm just, I'm just saying, you're not going to miraculously wake up the next morning at five or six or whatever and go delight and begin just delighting the next day and the next. If you continually make it a habit to walk away from God's word in the absence of delight, you will only persist in walking away from God's word and experiencing an absence or experiencing delight. That is the path that you're carving out. It's, it's foolish. So don't walk away from God's word in that moment. Persist. Pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to incline your heart to him and his word. Keep reading. Keep thinking on the scriptures and praying for God to help, to help you delight in them. Because the time spent reading and meditating leads to delighting. The time spent me, uh, reading and meditating leads to delighting. So Philippians, in Philippians 4 eight, Paul says it this way a little bit. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, 
whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so as I said, meditating is simply it's, it's a word for thinking about, it's for thinking on things. I want you to think about something that you enjoy doing every day, like, some, like a hobby, something that you enjoy doing today, that you would be glad to do today. An activity you enjoy doing, that's it. It could be physical, like biking or, or wrestling or something, but, or it's like writing or creating music or art. An activity you enjoy. At some point, and if you disagree here, I, I, I want to call you a liar, uh, there's a lull in your pursuit of enjoying that activity. There's a lull of delight eventually. Like it feels like a burden at some point. You're like, man, I just don't want to do this. I love this thing. I don't want to do it though. I just need a break. Like you have a lull of desire and delight to want to do that thing. And maybe you, maybe you do continue to do it. Or maybe you go, oh, I'll just take a break for this week or this, whatever it is. In, in, that, in the course of that experience and as that's happening, what does not produce and cultivate delight for that activity in the moment is ceasing from avoiding the activity. You don't walk, you don't walk away. From, oftentimes you walk away and you go, man, I wish I would have done that. There's like regret. You're like, I should have done it. I, and, at, and that's the reality. I'm, as we've experienced, one time or another, we do the thing we don't want to do. We do the activity, the, the hobby we enjoy doing, whatever it is. And we find delight in the midst of the activity. We're doing that thing we don't want to do. We're like, I'm so glad I did this. We find ourselves then thinking and meditating after the fact, after it's over. I'm so glad I didn't opt out of doing that. And so my question is, do you meditate on the law of the Lord? I want to encourage us to carve out time to think and pray on the scriptures. And if you don't, if you don't meditate, if that's not a reality, I'm not, I'm not shamed, I'm not condemning you. My encouragement is that we make a plan today to begin doing that. And so what this could look like, just a little practical help for us is that you take time, perhaps you're already carving out time to read. So you literally are carving out time to not just read, but then you have set time to just think, journal, and pray. And that's it. Maybe it's in addition to your reading. That's great. But the point is having carved out minutes throughout the day, two, three minutes, breakfast, lunch, dinner, in between, in between meetings, whatever it may be, to reorient yourself around the scriptures, to get with the Father and to be thinking on the scriptures. And so you carve out time to read God's word. And, and like I said, perhaps you have a journal and a pen and you're writing down questions that you're thinking about as you're thinking about script, the scriptures. But, the, but you're slowing down long enough, right, to read, to think, and delight in God's word. You've got to slow down long enough. You're writing down things that stand out to you in the verses, your thoughts, your questions, the things you're confused about, but you're thinking about it as you're reading it, which eventually, and my encouragement in those moments would be, man, you have all these questions. You have all these things you're noticing. You have, you have these things that maybe you're, man, this is awesome. You're delighting God's word. May that lead you then in those moments to pray. You just pause, you pray, you ask the Holy Spirit to show you how to respond. How do you need to repent? And ask the Holy Spirit to help you better understand the scriptures where there is confusion. If this sounds familiar, this is actually, in fact, in part, what our discipleship groups here at the well commit to. This is part of what they do. This is a regular rhythm that these groups commit to. They gather weekly to discuss these, this time that they spent reading, meditating, memorizing and praying through the scriptures that they commit to doing as a group. But the reality is, again, is this, is this takes intentionality. It takes intentionality. And so you got to set up five, ten minutes, like you've got to sit down with your calendar, with your schedule. All right, where do I have five minutes? I know we have five minutes. As Pastor Al reminded us last week, again, we have, to be, we have to slow down long enough to hear from the Lord. You have to slow down long enough to hear from the Lord. Uh, for me, I often tell people there are times of quicker, quicker intake, if you will, of God's word, like where you're maybe perhaps on the move. 
Uh, for instance, for me personally, this looks like listening to just a year, like there's just an always going year long uh, Bible plan on my phone. And I'm just listening to the Bible as I'm going places. If I'm, if I'm out the door early in the morning, which many of us, have, us are, that's the first thing I try to get in my ears. Like you had a late night, kids didn't sleep, you didn't wake up early, now you got a 10 minute drive. God's word's the first thing we put in our ears. And so every morning you're in the car and that's the first thing in your heart, in your mind. And so that's a bit quicker, right? Like you're on the move doing that because you're not journaling while you're driving, right? I hope, um, maybe we are, like San Antonio is really well known for our drivers, but, but there's slower, like more contemplative times. So you don't journal in the car, maybe when you arrive at your destination, but there's more contemplative, meditative times, which look, as I've described in part, you're reading, you're sitting down at a table somewhere at your desk and you're thinking and meditating. And so my, my point is this, is I would encourage and I often encourage individuals to have both components, fight to have both components. So there's a, there's a slower, contemplated, meditative time with journaling, but then, man, you're like, I'm on the go here. I'm on the go there. All right, you want to hear God, you want to hear God speak? Play the Bible through your speakers. Listen to his word. But don't wait to feel like that morning or that afternoon. I'll just do it later that afternoon when I, when I'm, when I feel like it. I don't feel like doing it right now, so I'm just not going to do it. Don't wait. Psalm 1 doesn't say, when you feel ready, when you feel super rested, when you're really excited and just joyful, and you got 12 hours of sleep, hey, delight in the law of the Lord then and meditate on it. You all know it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. And so often, Christians... I'm sure many of us in this room, myself included, we just, we just, we don't, it's, it's how we feel dictates the outcome of that, of those moments. We wait until we feel like meditating. We wait until we feel like reading. We wait until we think, feel like journaling and, and reading or memorizing, excuse me. And yet we still, we still expect to delight in the absence of the disobedience. That's what it is. We still, we're going, man, I want delight this morning, Lord, but I don't want your word. Or I do, but I just don't have the light to do it, so I'm not going to do it. Give me the light, Father. You, you can, I say that, and some of you are like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't. And so we want to wait till we feel like praying. We want to wait till we feel like giving extra thoughts, is what we call it, and time to meditate on his word. And we, uh, we usually say, I don't want to be, I don't want to be religious. I don't want to look like, I don't want to be like the Pharisees. And I'm like, man, the Pharisees, they knew the word of God. They knew the law. They studied it day and night. That wasn't their issue. Their issue was their misunderstanding of the fact that their righteousness was not based on their knowledge and good deeds and practice of reading God's word and obeying. Rather, it was based on Jesus. That, that's why I wanted us to start with that. Hey, this, our hope is in Jesus. Because some of you, I know, are expert planners. You got the schedule plan it's perfect and you're confused why you're still not delighting it's because our hope should be in jesus and so i'm not against discipline ask my wife i i want to be the most disciplined person planned out person ever i i'm for being disciplined so be disciplined christian but remember it's for the purpose of godliness not your own not your own it's Jesus. It's about Jesus. Read God's word every day, no matter how you feel. But we must be disciplined to read God's word and not just wait till we feel like doing it. Don't wait till you feel like doing it. Unfortunately, that is the case. That is the case. I know I've been talking about it this whole time already. That is the case. But I want to give us some, some legitimate statistics here. Um, a poll conducted shows that only 11%, this is Americans, okay? So 11% of Americans, I'm not talking about Christian, maybe, yeah, if you're American, yeah, this includes you, but 11% of Americans read their Bibles every day. I'm shocked by that percentage if you're not. And then more than half read it, less than once a month or never at all. More than half. So we'll just say 60%. Read it less than once a month or never at all. So that's Americans. 
Uh, so we'll talk about Christians. It's not much better. Uh, it's not much better at all, I promise. Um, so Barna does, did a study, and the percentage shows that only 18%, so we got 7% up on the rest of our American brothers and sisters, 7% more. Uh, 18% read the Bible every day. So that's, if you like fractions, that's less than two of every 10 people. Really small. Uh, and 23%, that's almost one in four, that's almost, it's not even a fourth, all right? Uh, one in four Christians say they never read God's word. Almost one in four Christians say they, they, they never read it. I don't, I might get in trouble. For, I, I don't, I question if they are Christians. Never reading God's word as a Christian is just weird to me. Like, We've talked about it. It's like saying I'm a Spurs player, but I'm not. But I wear the jersey, and I'm. Do you play? Do you practice? No, I don't practice with them. Do you know the player? No, don't know the players, but I got the jersey. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It's absurd. And so, a Christian that doesn't read their Bible, it's like a, it's like a tailor, right? Who is just unfamiliar with and doesn't ever work with suits. Like you don't, don't go to that guy. You're gonna look really silly after when you go to the wedding. Like. You don't go to that tailor. You don't want to talk to that tailor. You don't want them to measure, you know, your arms and your legs and all that. You're not going to do that. Uh, theologian and pastor Steve Lawson said it this way. He said, your Christian life will not grow, he says, one inch beyond your intake of the word of God. Your Christian life will not grow one inch beyond your intake of the word of God. I tend to agree like, and, and would say, likewise, your delight in the law of the Lord, because that's what we're talking about. Your delight in the law of, of the Lord will not grow an inch beyond your intake of the word of God. Again, the purpose of walking the ancient path that we're talking about and reading and delighting in God's word is to be made more like Christ. So if you're not doing that, we should not expect to be made more like Christ. But that is the purpose, that we would grow in godliness. So if you decide, I'm never going to read, I'm never going to delight in God's word, you will cease to grow in godliness while simultaneously, this is the scary part because it's always happening, being formed by the world in everything around you. Well, I, well, I, go, to, I go to Bible study every week. It doesn't matter you need God's word personally. Jesus died for you personally, to have a relationship with you personally. So you can't live on someone else's devotion. And so to wait and to feel like you, to read, it's just foolish, guys. It is. It's consenting to say what we see in Jeremiah. It's saying, I will not choose the good and godly ancient path you've set before me, Lord. That's what you're saying. No, Lord. No, Lord. I will not go the way you've set before me for my good. I hear you. I'm not going that way. If you wait to feel like reading, praying, meditating, whatever, you, you, you will either never do these things, as we've probably personally, some of us have experienced, as we see in the statistics. Um, you're going to live so malnourished by the word of God. It's as if, as I've hinted at already, you may, you're, you're wondering, man, am I a Christian at all? I don't know. That's how you're going to feel. And so I'll, I'll, ask it, I'll ask us to think about this a little bit more is you eat every single day. Everybody in here, I'm not even going to ask you. I originally was going to ask you, y'all eat food every day. You drink water every day. You do. If you don't, we know what happens. You gradually over time become malnourished. That's what happens. It's the same with the word of the Lord. You need a daily diet of God's word because it is Jesus that saves us. It is Jesus in his word that sustains us. Does it have to be, I know this is the thing we get caught up in. We have this picture perfect idea of what our friend is doing or whatever, whoever's doing it or what you, what you did for the longest time and then you had a kid and then you had two kids and you had three kids and you're like, I don't know what to do. It's just different now. It's not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. But you need the nourishment and the power of the word of God every single day 
lest you be spiritually malnourished. And so I, I want to encourage, I want to exhort us, don't wait till you feel like reading. Read. Pray for God to incline your hearts to Him and His Word, and then pick up the Word and read. With consistency, with discipline, you're going to find yourself reading more, delighting more, thinking about, meditating on God and His Word more. And this is what it means, as, we, as Psalm 1 talks about, the blessed man, this is what it means to be the blessed and truly happy man. But the reality is, is you must make it a regular rhythm to read and delight in the law of the Lord. You can't ever hope to delight and meditate if you don't read it. So resolve today to read and delight in God and His Word every morning. All right, second point. Here we go. Fruitfulness, all right? Next couple verses, we're going to talk about fruitfulness. Inevitably, upon your regular and consistent rhythms of reading and meditation, what we see in Psalm 1 is, in fact, that fruit is bore, right? The discipline, the discipline of reading and meditating on God's Word produces good and godly fruit. There's no way around it. Verse 3 says, He, referring to the man that delights and meditates on his word, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does he prospers. So the man or woman that delights in God's word is like a tree planted by streams of water and they produce fruit in its season. Their leaf doesn't wither and everything they do, they prosper. John 15 says it this way, the first five verses. It's on the screen. You don't have to turn there. If you don't want to, I'll read it. I am the true vine, and the Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word, because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch can't bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me, and I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless what? It abides in the vine. It abides in the vine. Whoever abides in Christ, who is the vine, bears much fruit. Likewise, the tree in Psalm 1, you and I, we can't bear fruit by ourselves. Unless what? We abide in Christ and remain planted by the stream of water that are God and His Word in the, in the Lord. Only then, only then will we bear much fruit. And so if you read verse 3 and you hope to be a Christian that's fruitful, like, oh, I want to I be a Christian that produces good and godly fruit. I desire that. You have to remain and abide with Christ. You have to. You must stay planted by the stream of water. Do not depart from Jesus. Do not depart, depart from his word. Don't deviate from what he says. The individual that delights in and are familiar with God's word are like a tree planted by a stream of water and a tree that has regular, consistent intake of God's word is alive, it's thriving, and it produces godly fruit, period. That's it. But he says, he goes on to say, their leaf does not wither, but instead, what does he say? That all they do, in all that they do, they prosper. And so it's clear, I hope, that there's blessing when we remain and abide in God and his word. There's blessing. And so in tough circumstances, they bear fruit and prosper, these individuals. In easy circumstances, they're bearing fruit and they prosper. Mundane, like they bear fruit and prosper. Basically, whether they're like in a storm, leaving a storm, in between storms, they bear fruit and prosper. And here's the other thing about fruit is that they bear fruit and prosper and bless others as a result. They bless others. So, because you see, the fruit of a tree, it's a blessing to the people around it. It's not just the tree 
you and I that experience the blessing, but it's the people that are involved in and a part of your life that experience blessing too. That's the result. And so the question I want to ask is, is, ask us is, are you bearing and producing fruit? And if so, what kind of fruit are you producing? And is it actually a blessing to those around you? If you're like, man, I'm, I'm really not sure. I think most of us know, but that's okay. Like genuinely you don't know, uh, ask someone close to you. Ask them, ask them today. Ask them when you leave. Hey, am I like, when you're around me, am I a blessing? Or am I like, do I like bring hell when I'm around? Like, what is it like? Tell me, just be honest with me. Ask, if you're in a community group, ask somebody in your CG. Ask your community group leader. Ask someone in your discipleship group. They'll tell you. I'll tell you. (laughs) Not right now. Uh, But the point, I hope we see though, the key to fruitfulness, it's not self-will or external behavior modifications. Discipline is important. I'm not going back on that. But it's about remaining and staying submitted to, abiding in God and his word. But again, you can only do that if you delight in his word day and night. That's it. We're going to keep going back to it. Delighting in God's word results in fruitfulness. So ultimately, what we see here in verse 3 is the reality that Christians who are rooted in God's word are actively, consistently bearing good fruit in all that they do, and they prosper. And then, on the flip side, there are those that root themselves in other things, draw life from other streams, are not good, are not godly, and what we see is that they will dry up like chaff and be blown away. The rooted and watered tree will endure by God's strength and his word, and the unnourished and wicked ultimately have no permanence. They have no permanence. Verse 4 says, The wicked are not so, but they're like chaff that the wind drives away. So again, there's a distinction between the righteous man planted by streams of water and then the wicked. There's the one that chooses to walk in God's word and his will and his way, and then the one that says, no, we will not walk in it. They are the wicked. Verse 4 says, regarding these people, the wicked are not so. The wicked are not planted by streams of water that are in Christ. They don't yield good and godly fruit in season. The wicked are not a blessing to those around them. The wicked does not endure and its leaf doesn't wither. And they do not prosper in all that they do in season to in season to season. He talks about them, the wicked being like chaff that are blown away with the wind. So if you know what chaff is, it's just like the husk of like a tamale or a corn, like a the husk of a corn. What's it what do y'all do with that? Hopefully, I mean, I throw it away. Uh, it's not good for anything. It's good for nothing. They bring it doesn't there's no benefit to it to using it. And so that's what this, the wicked people are being described as. They bring no benefit to anything. They're, they're, they're as useless as a husk. You take it off, you throw it away, good for nothing. That's the wicked. And the last thing I'll say here is just, to, just consider, you know, consider what is described here about the wicked. If there, if there are parts, little parts here that, man, these are dead on for you. Like, oh, that, that actually resonates with me. You're like, oh, I'm a Christian, though, but this resonates with me. My aim right now is not to go, to, again, to condemn, to shame, or to beat you up. Rather, I'd encourage you to see, to praise God that he's showing you this reality and repent. And make steps towards Christ. Regardless, regardless, I, I just want, I'll ask all of us this. Will you walk the path of the righteous? That's the question. Will you walk the path of the righteous? And if today you find yourself saying, I'm not going to consult the Lord on how I may live my life. My life is mine. I'm not going to consult him. I won't walk the path of the righteous. Sounds good. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to walk in the way of the wicked. I'm going to stand in the way of sinners. I'm going to sit in the seat of scoffers. That's what I'm going to do. Then I just genuinely, Ask, please consider the consequences of your response. All of us today, as I said, we will respond. The question is, will you walk the path of the righteous or will you walk the path of the wicked? 
Will you resolve to delight in and meditate on the word of God daily or continue in your rebellion? Because there are ultimate consequences. And so verse 5 and 6, let's look at the ultimate consequences. He says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. It's pretty clear. If you choose today and for the remainder of your life here on earth to walk in rebellion, we see that the wicked and the sinful will not be among the righteous in the life to come. That's the ultimate consequence. The truth is God sent his only son, Jesus, to rescue you and redeem you. He stood in your place for your sins, bearing, taking the full wrath of God, exchanging his righteousness for your sin, giving you his righteousness. And so if you choose to deny that, to deny what's known as the great exchange and and the gift of salvation that's found only in Jesus, you will experience the full wrath of God forever. You will. And if God didn't spare his only son, Jesus, he's not going to spare you and you will not experience, as the text says, the joy of being in the presence of Jesus and the righteous, but rather you will take on the debt due your name because of your sin. So when God returns or calls you home, he's going to separate the righteous and the unrepentant. That's the ultimate consequence. And so what we see ultimately is a life that is unrepentant now will lead to judgment and wrath forever. For those of us, though, who, however, are repentant, the encouragement, again, is remain in Christ by staying in his word. Abide in Christ. Remain repentant. Remain repentant. Verse 6, he says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I spoke to this a little bit. I'll say it again, that the Lord knows the way of the righteous personally. Personally. He himself knows the way of the righteous personally. Psalm 1, guys, is about Jesus. Jesus has done the things we cannot do. Jesus, the blessed and truly happy God-man, did not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Jesus did not stand in the way of sinners. Jesus did not sit in the seat of scoffers. Jesus found true delight in the law of the Lord. And Jesus was, however, he was in the presence of the wicked. He was in the presence of sinful, the sinful and the scoffers, those testing the Lord, mocking him, yet he did not sin. And so Jesus, I hope we see he's demonstrated for you and I and fulfilled Psalm 1 perfectly. And therefore, Jesus has set this path that we aim to walk before us. But we, de- we again, we don't walk the path We don't walk the path by walking, standing, or sitting like the wicked, emulating them. We do it by trusting in Jesus, following Jesus, obeying Jesus and his word. And again, our hope, therefore, has to be, has to be anchored in Jesus. Nowhere else. And so the Lord knows the way of the righteous and the wicked, which will perish. The Lord knows which path you are on. The question today is, will you continue on the path of the righteous or will you continue on the path of the wicked? Will you repent today and follow in obedience to Jesus? That's the question. And that's how we're going to respond. And so as you, as you respond here in a moment, that's what I want you to take time and consider. Which path are you going to continue on today? I hope we see the reality that God has called us to know and delight in his word daily, regularly, frequently. And as a result, we will bear good fruit, godly fruit. He has set the path before us that he himself has walked. Jesus has experienced what it is to produce good and godly fruit and shown us what it is to prosper in all seasons. 
And so the way of the unrepentant rebellion does ultimately lead to destruction, and there is a debt that must be paid. John 3, 16 and 17 says it this way. You may be familiar with it. It says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17 says, For God didn't send his Son, Jesus, into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So hear me, the Lord does not desire that you would perish, but you would be saved and by Jesus, by Jesus, and then spend your days enjoying, delighting, worshiping Jesus. The Lord wants to not only see you prosper, but to live a life delighting in Him. To live a life, notice I didn't say delighting in your circumstances. I'm delighting in Him, delighting in Jesus. This is what it means to be a truly happy and blessed man. So the path has been set before you. Will you walk in the ways of the righteous by, your, by the strength and power of the Holy Spirit? That's the question. Or will you continue in unrebellion, continue in unrepentance, and risk perishing apart from Christ forever? My prayer, my hope is that all of us here today would walk according to God's word, God's will, in God's way. The question is, what will you resolve to do today?